we decided to make uh, sp uh, maps for these sets of species that are only present during summer. These are breeders, but that disappear in the winter. We have a set of species that are only present in winter, and we have 30 species that are only present as transients. So we, th this is a very useful way that we can recover patterns of the diversity and, and endemism according to the, the migratory status of the species. And I hope it's more, more clear when we, when we look at, uh, at the data. Okay, so imagine that we are work, working on this. We, we, we use it GARP, that is one of the algorithms, uh, one of the systems that we have to, to produce potential distribution maps based on ecological niche modeling. And this is the example of a map that depicts a resident species, that is a species that is, stays year-round in the area. But there are species that have different, different, different distribution patterns according to the, to the season. For example, this, this swallow, the rough, rough wind swallow, in most of the countries are resident. But, but dur during, dur during winter, the northernmost populations migrate south. So we, need, we needed to produce two, uh, uh, a set of two maps for this species in which one depicts the distribution during summer and the distribution during winter. This is another kind of species that presents migratory movements and that has to be depicted in a map. Otherwise, you don't understand the real dynamics of the, of this, of the diversity, the species richness. This, this flycatcher is a breeder in northern North America. It crosses Mexico as a transient during the autumn and it stays as a winter resident in this area dur during the winter. So also we have two, two different d distribution areas for different seasons of the year. Once you have this group of maps, you are able to recover dif the different patterns of, of the species richness according to different uh, questions we, we want to do. First question, how many species do we have? It's very easy to do. We have, to, we have these maps that depict the, distribu the summer distributions of all the species that, that are present in summer and then make uh, a, su a sum, yes, su sum see, of maps and that's the way we generate this surface that depicts the species richness during summer. This is a, the, the grid, the, the legend here depicts the number of species that are depicted by each color. If what you see here is exactly the pattern that we were talking uh, a while ago. We have a very rich area in terms of number of species in the, co in the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, that is a more humid region. We have low diversity in the arid lands. We have high species richness along the mountains and along the coasts, and low species richness in the very hot and dry areas of the Balsas Basin and the Cuicatlan Valley. And this is a very important pattern that we want to recover to understand the diversity of Mexican birds. This is a species richness in winter. What happens in winter? We have, besides these species that are always there, we have in winter a group of species, the neotropical mig migrants, that come to spend the winter in the, in the region. And it is depicted here. So what we, di what we did is make us a sum of all the maps of the permanent residents 
and the winter distributions of the winter residents and generate this map. Also the patterns of species richness are more or less maintained, the, gen the overall patterns. However, the number of species that are present in each pixel as, as possibly present changes. This is the figure for endemism. Of course, we, we define endemism in the, in the geopolitical grounds. So we define all the, as endemic any species that man, is maintained, whose distribution it's only within the political boundaries of Mexico. We define as quasi endemics all the species that are contained mainly within Mexico, but less than 10% of the distribution are present in adjacent areas in North America and Central America. And here's the, here's the, the distribution patterns of that species richness of endemic species. Of course, again, we pulled out only a subset of the, of the maps that, that were classified as endemics. And you see, of course, the endemism is concentrated away from the borders with other countries and is concentrated in the lowlands of the Pacific coast and the mountains. If we expand our geographic coverage, we, we are able to recognize some other, some other patterns. This is a very old work that even town don't remember that we, we performed some, some day ago. We were trying to, to recover the patterns of the species richness in different, in different sets, sets of, of species, especially the neotropical migrants, the species that breathe mainly in North America and winter in Mexico and Central America. So we developed this, again, this set of maps that depict the summer distribution and the winter distribution. This is overlapping but because you see the, the, the map, the, the red map comes here a little bit and the winter map is, uh, is, is overlaying this. This is, a, this, is this, this circle depicts an area where both wintering and resident populations interact. This is another kind of migratory species in which there, are, there is no overlap of distributional areas in different seasons. This is the breeding area, again, the summer, the summer distribution. This is the winter distribution. And what we have is something that has never been published. But it is really interesting. This map depicts the summer distribution, the breeding distributions of about a hundred species of passerines that breathe in North America. The, the question here is, we want to know where this richness, because we, we're speaking about the same species, is found when it's winter. Look. So, while, the, while most of the species diversity of this subset of passerines is concentrated as breeding in southern Canada, northern the United States and western United States, the great amount of species during winter are concentrated in Mexico. So this is, this is a very neat analysis that can be performed once, we, once you have this, this kind of maps. Using again this framework of, of distributional maps, we were, we were able also to ask questions about how differences in the land use, how changes in, uh, in, the, in, in the ecology of the region are affecting the distributional the distributional areas of the species and how these changes in distributional areas of individual species are affecting the, the general patterns of the diversity that, that we found. This is an exercise that was done several years ago that what it's saying is we have 
the hypoth distribution or hypothesis of, for the presence of one species, in, in this case parrots, under ideal conditions. This is the, the projected the, the projected distribution of in the ecological niche modeling. And here what you have is a distributional hypothesis that takes out all the areas that contains habitat that is transformed and that is not suitable for the presence of the species. What you see is a, different, a certain amount, amount of difference in the size of the distributional areas. In, in this case, uh, overall 10% of the distributional area of the species is lost due to the changes in land use. Another example, see, in, the, in this case, the, cha the changes for this species are, are largest. L look at the, the hypothetic distribution of, the, of this parrot species and the distribution of this species after we removed all the areas that are unsuitable for its presence. And, I'm sorry, in this case, it's around 25% of the areas lost due to the land use changes in the region. In this, this is another case. This is the projected distribution, the original distribution. This is the amount of distribution that remains after we removed the unsuitable areas. This species have suffered about 32% of the distribution of the original area due only due to land use changes. This work was done with Jace. It's a, it's a similar example. See, what you see here is the, the percent of reduction of the areas given land use changes. See, this is a, a group of corvids in Mexico. And you see that every species responds differently to, to the changes of land use. Okay, we, we have these two, two dates of Land, land use maps that we can use to, to take, to take the, the parts of the area that are unsuitable to them. You can see that one species that is what? This, this is Cyanolica, a cloud forest, and a cloud forest specialist has had dramatic reductions in the in the, in the distribution area, other species are, are more tolerant to changes in, in land use. But the, the good thing is that we can make a comparison of how, how many species, how, how these changes in land use are affecting the overall distribution of the species richness. And what you see here is how many species have been lost due to land use changes. The darkest, the darkest areas mean that more species have been lost. The lighter areas is less species have been lost. And as you see, as you see this leads to, to dramatic changes in the distribution of the species richness along an area, just because of the land use changes. <coughs> I, I'm, I'm almost done, sorry, sorry, it's time for lunch. This is an, an application on the, on nothing because nothing to do with the species richness. However, this, this is the, 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 the modeling for a species that is known for two sites in Mexico, one in, the, in, in central Mexico and populations that thought to be extinct in northwestern Mexico. The, the projection of, of the data in of, of the data in the area where the species is still present to the to the area when it was present led to the rediscovery of a population of this species in Mexico. So nothing to do. And finally, for this set of set set of things, we use this infrastructure of constructed maps to generate species lists. 
This is a very, uh, this is a very useful tool. We have a bunch of protected areas in Mexico, well, a bunch, if you can call this a bunch, but we have a bunch of potentially protected areas, of, of areas that should potentially be protected to assure that most of the Mexican bird diversity is, is protected. This, this is a map of IBAS. Are you familiar with the term IBA? The important bird area. This, this is an initiative from BirdLife International that wants to detect areas important for birds in different, in different, uh, in a different manner. Could be areas with high numbers of species. Would be areas with high number of endemics. Endemics. Could be areas areas where great concentrate num great numbers, great concentrations of individuals of uh, certain species are found. And essentially, this is the set the set of of areas that we ornithologists recommend to be protected. And this is the areas that the, the Mexican government are protecting. 